Hello, my name is Marshall McMunn, and I'll be giving the lecture on climate change and insects for ENT 10. Just to give you an outline of what to expect during this lecture, first we'll go over the basics of climate change, some of the observed effects, the underlying cause, um, then we'll move on to consider the unique aspects of life as an ectotherm. We'll consider some interesting adaptations that insects have to navigate life as an ectotherm. And then we'll briefly touch on what to expect um, from the future of insects in a world with a changing climate. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is the basic mechanism that underlies climate change. And so all of the Earth's heat originates from the sun. This solar radiation travels across space. Some of it permeates through, going through our atmosphere and hitting the surface of the Earth. The Earth absorbs this radiation and then actually re-emits it as a different wavelength of light, this time infrared. And then the, the key aspect of climate change is that greenhouse gases essentially function like a blanket does as we use it in keeping some of that heat near the Earth's surface. And by modifying the amount of these gases that can reflect some of this heat back to Earth, we've essentially thickened the Earth's blanket. And so we have the same amount of heat coming in from the sun, um, but we now have a thicker blanket. And so more of that heat sticks around for just a little bit longer, and the Earth gets just a little bit warmer. And so to consider how much warmer, I think one striking way to consider this warming is to, to watch this video um, that has been produced by NASA, which shows the temp temperature anomalies for the last approximately century and a half. And what you're going to see um, is the map of the world. And painted onto this map of the world, we're going to see the deviation in temperature um, as compared to the average temperature between 1950 and 1980. So when we start the movie, we're going to see the initial temperature measurements that we have from about the 1880s, and we'll observe the temperature change over the last approximately century and a half. And so here you see the late 1800s, early 1900s. It was cooler than it was in the 1950s. We just passed the 1940s. The 1970s. The 1990s. And the 2000s. And hopefully what you saw was at least two things. One, the, the average temperature on Earth is warming. The average color that we saw on the map began as a blue color and we saw the blue shift gradually to this red color. And so over the last century and a half the earth has warmed across its surface. But another thing to take away is that this warming has not occurred evenly. You can see this sort of bright red splotch um, near the pole. And that is how we observe this uneven heating of the Earth's surface. We see more heating, um, especially up by the North Pole, um, across Russia, across Europe. Um, across the Northern Hemisphere, we see this more extreme heating. And so we can surmise that humans have warmed the climate so far, by approximately one degree 
on average across the surface of the Earth. So one degree Celsius. We know from how greenhouse warming progresses and how much carbon dioxide humans are putting into the Earth that we can anticipate some amount of future warming. And so this is a figure demonstrating that um, over time, temperature has increased. That's the orange line on the left side. So as we move forward in time to present day, temperature has increased approximately one degree. And then we see a few different scenarios of warming that would result from humans changing their behavior with respect to emitting greenhouse gases. And the thing I'd like you to take away from this is that most of these scenarios include an additional half to full one degree warming um, in the next 20 to 40 years. And so that's an incredibly rapid change. Um, and we expect this to continue to be more dramatic in the polar regions. Um, and this could result in more extreme events um, like heat waves or hurricanes. Um, or droughts, or floods. And so this is a big concern for human society broadly, but today we're here to talk about insects in particular and how climate change might affect them. And so one of the probably most important things that I could convey in this lecture is that we are very different than insects in how we deal with temperature. When we go outside and it's cold, we start to shiver. We start burning more energy. Our body temperature on the inside remains stable. And that's what's being displayed in this graph in the bottom panel. We see a mouse, which is an endotherm, a organism that generates heat from inside. And so endo means inside, therm means heat. Heat from within is what an endotherm does. And so this mouse, when you expose it to warmer or colder temperatures, its internal body temperature, if you were to measure it, remains relatively stable. It has the means to buffer its body temperature against change. And so as you move along the x-axis, you can see the outside temperature changing, but this mouse's internal body temperature remains constant. This is very different than how an ectotherm experiences temperature in the world. And so this ectothermic snake changes in body temperature as the environment changes. And so as its environment warms, so does the inside of its body. And this crucial difference um, really affects our expectations for insects with climate change, because all insects are ectotherms. Okay, and so if we look at this graph of how much biomass there is on Earth and how it's split up between these different taxonomic groups, we can see that animals in the lower right corner are this very small gray triangle. If we subdivide that into the different taxonomic groups, we can see the arthropods, which include insects, uh, make up much of the animal biomass. And then there's these other groups as well. And if we actually shade only the endotherms on this figure, we can start to appreciate how vanishingly rare this lifestyle is. And this seems odd. I just explained all of these benefits of being an endotherm. You know, when, you, when it gets cold out, you stay warm. When it gets warm, you have a mechanism to cool your body temperature. It seems like this strategy would be common in the world once it had evolved. Why aren't there more endotherms? And so take a moment, pause the video, and consider why there might be so little biomass on Earth for endotherms compared to ectotherms, which include these insects. Okay, so the primary reason that an endotherm is so rare um, is that 
it takes an enormous amount of energy to keep the body temperature stable while the outside temperature is changing. And so to produce this heat, there is ultimately only one way for the endotherm to deal. And so it can only burn food energy. And so it literally has to just burn food in order to stay warm. And that excess cost in having to burn food has to come from somewhere. And so it needs to find more food. It needs to eat more plants. It needs to eat more insects um, in order to maintain its body temperature. And so, well, it's an advantage to be able to go outside when it's 10 degrees cooler and have your body remain the same temperature. Um, that advantage comes at this huge cost of having to eat far more food. And so oftentimes we see this strategy of becoming the same temperature as your environment, uh, which seems weird to us because we ourselves are endotherms. But it's a much more common strategy across all animals um, than is our strategy, which is to maintain our body temperature. And so ectotherms must have some strategies to deal with temperature variation. And so for the rest of the sort of this next part of the lecture, we'll consider what life is like as an ectotherm in response to temperature. OK, so what we're looking at here is a somewhat complicated figure, but I'll walk you through it one step at a time. And on the y-axis, we have temperature. And so you can consider that the temperature of the organism itself. How warm or cold is this insect, uh, with warm being on the right side? On the y-axis, you can see performance. And that could mean any measure. Um, oftentimes, people wish it meant how many offspring an organism had. But more often, it's something like, how fast can an insect run? And so we'll say um, how warm a beetle is on the x-axis, and how fast the beetle runs on the y-axis. The first thing to notice is that as the beetle warms from the very left side to the middle of the graph, we see an increase in performance. And so this beetle can run faster as it warms up. And this is simply a result of the fact that chemical reactions happen faster in heat. And so this beetle's muscles are able to deliver sugar um, and produce ATP faster just because it's hot out. Um, and we use this to our advantage all of the time. Um, when we wash our clothes, uh, you can choose between the warm and the cold cycle. But chemical reactions happen faster when it's warmer. And so if you have a particularly difficult stain, uh, then you're more likely to use the warm cycle. Because you can intuit that that chemical reaction of cleaning um, will happen faster when it's hot. The other thing I'd like you to notice about these curves is that performance declines very quickly after we pass this optimum temperature. And this is for a different reason, but one I also suspect you're familiar with. And so enzymes denature when they're too hot. And what that means in plain English is that the very proteins that this beetle requires to have to run, to be able to run across the floor, those proteins start to fall apart when they get too hot. And one really common example of this that you're probably familiar with is that of cooking an egg. And so when you cook an egg, you notice that it turns from clear to white. And that white is actually what it looks like when proteins denature. When the proteins fall apart, they become more opaque. Um, you can no longer see through them. And so as you expose them to great heat, um, they begin to fall apart, um, and they are no longer able to be repaired. And so there's this optimum temperature called T-opt, that's between where chemical reaction, where the temperature helps chemical reactions happen faster, like when you clean your clothes, 
and when the insect is actually being cooked um, by temperatures that are too hot. And so given these two things that I've told you, that when insects are exposed to different temperatures, their body changes temperature, and that they have this performance curve where they have an optimal temperature where they can function. If it's too cold, they have some subpar performance. And if it's too hot, they're literally cooking themselves and they can't function efficiently. And so how do the insects avoid overheating and freezing in a world that changes within days, within seasons, across years? Um, how do they manage, and how are these ectotherms so common? One very common strategy among ectotherms um, can broadly be referred to as behavioral thermoregulation, which is a mouthful, but I think you'll find it more intuitive uh, than you might imagine. And so if you look at this figure, um, we can see this generic ectotherm um, living in its below ground chamber. The green line at the bottom of the graph represents the temperature inside its underground chamber. We can see that that doesn't really change much during the day. And so the temperature down there is stable. It doesn't change as the sun heats the air. We can then see this red line, which is the temperature outside this underground chamber. And so you might imagine that as the air temperature. It increases throughout the day, and then it decreases as the sun sets, getting cold at night. The most interesting thing here is that we can see the body temperature of this ectotherm as it's moving between these two places. And so by moving between a hot and cold place, it can moderate its body temperature both avoiding the heat of the day and some of the cold of the night. And so we call that buffering of body temperature. And so by moving between these two places, this ectotherm has made it possible to only expose itself to the sort of mild morning and evening temperatures. And that's those two bumps that you see of the purple line. That's morning and evening temperatures, respectively. So that's one thing ectotherms do, is they move around. They move between hot and cold places. And one fantastic example of an ectotherm using behavioral thermoregulation is this western harvester ant. And so these ants actually build these gigantic domes out in the desert, and the surface of the air right around this dome can very frequently um, increase in excess of 120 degrees Fahrenheit. But inside this dome, the ants actually move around. Um, as the sun moves across the surface of the dome, they actually can move from hot to cold parts of this dome and maintain a very stable internal body temperature despite living in the desert in this extreme heat. And so this adaptation of behavioral thermoregulation allows these ants, even in a desert environment, to maintain constant body temperature. And it's not at the cost of burning food, like an endotherm. Um, another example of behavioral thermoregulation is sort of the opposite. And here we see this insect with its wings spread out. But if we look at that insect in the infrared, if we actually look to see how hot that insect is, we can see that it's actually using its wings to collect solar radiation and heat up. And so this is much like you might um, lay out to heat up on a summer day. Um, you would feel your body uh, increasing in temperature, especially if you were wearing, say, a black t-shirt. Your black t-shirt would get really hot, 
as the sun's solar radiation is absorbed. And insects use this to, to their advantage all the time. And so if an insect comes out early in the morning, it is maybe a little sluggish and can't move very quickly because its performance is um, slowed by these low temperatures. It can actually find a sunny spot, extend its wings, and use that solar radiation to increase its own body temperature. And so even if it's cold outside, the insect's body temperature can be warmed from this solar radiation. And so this basking behavior, is what it's called, um, is very common among ectotherms. Um, and you can often observe butterflies doing this um, on flowers. Okay, so another strategy that insects use um, is a little more subtle. And so these first two, um, you can go out and see. In the, in the real world, in real time, you could go out and observe these strategies of behavioral thermoregulation. But another thing that insects do is time the different stages of their lives to be active as an adult um, during some of the most favorable times, um, to be eating as a caterpillar when there's abundant food. Um, and so their life cycles themselves are, are very frequently adapted to seasons. Um, one extreme example of this is the Arctic woolly bear moth. And so you would be very lucky to see an individual moth in this form. Um, flying around, looking like uh, a drab gray moth in the Arctic. What you would much more frequently see um, is that same moth as a caterpillar. And that's because this caterpillar living in the Arctic is on the extreme low end of that performance curve. It's only able to move and grow for a few weeks a year. It's so incredibly cold that it really can't um, move and grow during many, many weeks a year. And so its strategy is to actually grow so slow that it takes it seven years to mature into this adult moth. And so this adaptation to very cold temperatures has made this particular insect um, have this incredibly delayed life cycle. Um, we normally think of insects as being very short-lived. Um, these caterpillars, like I said, can live for up to seven years, growing and eating um, and waiting for the moment to mature into the adult moth um, which then only lives for an additional two to three weeks um, as an adult. And so it's a, a fairly extreme example of how you can time your activity um, and you can time your life stages uh, to deal with these extreme variations in climate, um, even in the Arctic. Okay, so we've talked about Two different ways that insects can cope with temperature. One is to use behavior to escape extreme temperatures. Another is to time their development such that adults emerge uh, when climate is most favorable. This next example illustrates another strategy, um, which is that of migration. And so Caterpillars of the monarch butterfly need to consume milkweed. There's abundant milkweed, uh, which is a, a plant with a very interesting defensive chemistry. There's a, abundant milkweed in the Midwestern United States. But the Midwestern United States gets incredibly cold in the winter. To escape that cold, uh, monarchs actually migrate to an overwintering ground. 
And so they fly across the entire continent down to overwintering grounds in Mexico and stay there for the remainder of the winter. And then they have to decide to fly north in order to time their egg laying with the new crop of milkweed in the spring. And so this arrival to the Midwest for the caterpillar um, that I've added the picture for here needs to be very carefully timed because the monarch needs to lay an egg on that plant um, and give that caterpillar enough time to develop. If it shows up too early, the plants aren't there, it's too cold, and that monarch will die. If it shows up too late, um, the plants may be more defended, or um, it may be too hot, too late in the summer, um, or the plants may have already um, senesced for the year. They may have dried out um, and no longer be appropriate for food. And so there's an ideal time at which these monarchs should leave Mexico. But unfortunately for the monarchs, they don't have access to information about what weather is like in the Midwest. They have to depend on some other cues, either internal or cues that they can receive in Mexico. And so this presents a challenge because they may not be getting accurate information um, or their internal clock may not be accurately calibrated if, say, the Midwest warms a week and a half earlier with climate change. And so if this monarch arrives too late or too early, we refer to this as a phenological mismatch. And what we mean by that is in phenological, that's the timing of life events, and mismatch, um, we now have this discrepancy. And so usually monarchs show up right when they want to, to lay eggs on these newly sprouted milkweed plants. And a phenological mismatch would be if the monarch showed up too early, there were no plants and they died, or too late um, and they weren't able to have these successful caterpillars. And so with climate change, this may be an issue that faces many insects. Um, the interactions between species of insects and between species of insects and plants may or may not respond to climate change in the same ways. Um, and this, this issue with a migratory insect um, sort of highlights how these discrepancies uh, might affect insects in the future. Okay, so we've covered some of the ways that insects deal with variation in temperature um, as it occurs in the natural world. But let's touch on briefly to, to end our time um, what we have seen and what we expect to continue to see um, in terms of insects responding to climate change. And so one way that insects have responded to climate change is to move where they live. And so if the world is getting warmer, then insects we would expect to maintain their current suitable temperature, we would expect those insects to shift where they live. Um, maybe they can move northward um, if they're in the northern hemisphere. And that's precisely what we see um, in this butterfly in Great Britain. And so we see the historical range in black, the uh, range in the 40s through the 60s in red, and then the range in the 70s through the 90s in blue. And we can see this systematic shift northward. And so range shifts are one way that insects are responding to, um, and we expect to continue to respond to climate change. Um, they move away from the equator. They move to cooler habitats. They can also move up mountains. And so it is cooler near the tops of mountains, um, and insects can shift where they live up in elevation. A few problems with this strategy 
are that if you live at the top of the mountain, um, you have nowhere to move to if it gets warmer, um, where you can find that suitable temperature nearby. Um, and another problem with this um, is if you live at the poles. If you are that arctic woolly bear caterpillar, um, then your suitable habitat may not be there. There may not be a north um, in which to move. Um, and not all insects have the flexibility and mobility um, of, say, a butterfly. Another thing that we're seeing in insects um, are these phenological shifts. And so I discussed the, the timing of the monarch migration. Um, there are many other timings that we can, we can discuss with insects. Um, say, what time of year a particular plant is blooming, um, and what time of year the moth emerges locally. And we can see these shifts both earlier in the spring and later in the fall um, as insects track their suitable temperatures. And so if an insect typically comes out in June, if the world has warmed, then its normal June time temperatures now occur, let's say, in late May. And so in order to track that temperature that's suitable for the insect, um, we can see, and we have seen in many insects, uh, a shift earlier in the spring. We see the same patterns for insects in the fall. Their activity is prolonged um, later into the fall than we've seen in the past. Um, and we may expect to see um, some shift away from midday activity. And so insects can adjust the timing um, of their various life stages to cope with climate change. Okay, so we've seen a lot of strategies of how insects are responding to climate change, um, but are they working? And this is where we um, start to worry, is when we see some of these results that have just started coming in uh, for insect populations. And so one thing to consider is how many insects there are in a particular place. And so people have been going out and counting insects for a long time. And sometimes they do a really good job of writing down exactly how they do it. And when they do that, we can go out in modern day and repeat the same methods. And we can get a measure of exactly how many insects are in a particular area. And what we see in at least a few studies is that there's a dramatic decline in insect abundance. And this hasn't been demonstrated globally, but in at least two studies, one in the tropics and one in a temperate region in Germany, we've seen some pretty significant declines in insect abundance. And so in the left panel here, um, I've sort of superimposed this red arrow to illustrate that on this performance curve, one cost that we would expect um, if we had elevated temperatures that insects are being exposed to um, is that performance can drop really rapidly on this right side of the curve. Um, if insects pass their optimum temperature, it doesn't take all that much heating to lead to some substantially negative effects. And so regardless of the mechanism, um, it might be climate, it might be habitat loss, it could be insecticide use, it could be the widespread use of artificial lights. Um, there's lots of ways in which insects could um, be affected by human activities um, and why their abundance has decreased so much. Um, but one potential explanation is that we've surpassed the optimal temperature for a lot of these insects. Um, here's another study where we see uh, many different measurements 
over the last few decades, uh, with progressively fewer and fewer insects being caught. Um, and this was, I believe, using a malaise trap um, in Germany, um, which is just used to collect insects flying around. And so there is less insect biomass flying around at this place in Germany um, than there was 30 years ago. And so um, this, is, this is somewhat alarming. Um, one, because uh, we depend on these insects. Uh, we need a viable insect population um, to have the world be habitable. Um, and another is that we don't necessarily know which of our activities is causing this decline. Um, and so it's likely some combination of all of these. Um, but it's also alarming that because all of these things are still happening. Um, all of these things are still increasing. And so regardless of the cause, um, this, is, this is concerning. Uh, this, this might represent um, one of the big challenges that we face in entomology is, you know, what's happening with these insects in this human-dominated world. The opposite issue is also expected to occur. And so we just talked about, in general, um, in a few sites so far, um, and I expect people are measuring additional sites as we speak, but in general, insects have decreased at several of these places. But another aspect of climate change is that it might not affect all insects equally. And so a lot of our crops are grown in temper regions. We grow tons and tons of food across um, the temperate regions of North America, Asia, and Europe. And those regions are expected to warm up. And with that warming, insect metabolic performance is expected to speed up. And when insects warm up, they actually need to eat more. And so, their bodies uncontrollably burn food faster when they are heated. And so they need to eat more. And because of this, because these temperate regions where we grow our food are expected to warm, um, we expect these insect populations to be not only eating more, um, but also increasing in size. And so this increase in performance with temperature on the left side of this performance curve could really negatively affect us in these cooler food growing regions. And so this was a recent um, meta-analysis that was put out in Science. And our expectation is that we can, um, we'll have increased crop loss in particular in temperate regions um, and to things such as wheat and rice um, as a result of warming um, and these physiological effects on insects. And so we might simultaneously have fewer insects in the world, but yet more problems with pest insects. And so this is another um, not only sort of societal issue, um, but a food safety issue. Um, we need to be able to produce enough food um, and this increased crop loss to, in a warmer world um, could significantly reduce uh, the ability of humans to produce food. Okay, so the final thing I'll talk about is extinction. And so what if all of the individuals of a species of an insect die? Um, how many species do we actually expect to lose? And this is a really big problem, um, and it's one that's really hard to measure because we don't even know how many insect species there are. Our best estimates 
range pretty wildly from you know roughly 10 million, maybe 30 million. Um, we don't even know roughly how many insect species exist in the world. And our predictions um, are usually extrapolated from pretty coarse measurements. And so this is a hard problem because we don't even know how many insects there are. And so we've probably already lost species that we would never have found. And so we never had a chance to find them because we drove them extinct before science even described them. But um, we can still do our best to make a guess at how many insects uh, will experience really negative effects of climate change. And one guess is that uh, by 2100, that 6 to 18 percent of insects in the world will lose much of their range. And so uh, greater than, I think, 50 percent of the places that they live now um, will no longer be habitable by those insects in 2100. And so, you know, that's a sort of a, a rough estimate and not exactly a measure of extinction. Uh, but I think the take home there is, you know, we have a rough guess and this is a significant impact on the number of insect species. Um, that's millions of species of insects that will be driven to extinction. Okay, so just to summarize, um, Hopefully, the things that you take away from this lecture are that insects are ectotherms. They change their body temperature with the environment. They don't just burn food to produce heat like we do. They use a bunch of different strategies to modify their temperature, including behavior, migration, and complex life cycles. Next, because of this complexity, we don't necessarily know exactly how climate change is going to affect insects. Um, we know that they're shifting in where they live. We know that they're shifting in when they develop. Um, we've seen very dramatic shifts, at least in a few cases, of how many insects are in one place. And we can expect that the number of species um, will decrease um, in the world in response to climate change. And so what does this mean for us? Um, you know, I think, I, I hope what you take away from this is that, you know, insects have a lot of tools in the toolkit to adapt to temperature. They're good at this. But they may not be enough. They may not be enough for every species of insect. Some species of insects won't be able to keep up, and they will go extinct. And so the key problem in determining how insects are going to respond to climate change is which species are most at risk, and do we depend on those particular species of insects? OK, so thanks for listening. Um, and shoot me an email if you have any questions. Um, I've attached a brief page of notes um, that summarize uh, some of the things I've said, and it should be on Canvas. Thanks.